Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and joining me to introduce today's podcast is the man behind the curtain, Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests who appear on STEM Talk. Hi, Don. Great to be here. So our guest today is Dr. Mark Matson, who is making his third appearance on STEM Talk. And Mark is affectionately known as the godfather of intermittent fasting. Today's interview, however, focuses on Mark's work on glutamate and comes on the heels of the publication of Mark's new book, Sculpture and Destroyer, Tales of Glutamate, the Brain's Most Important Neurotransmitter. That's a great book title, by the way. (laughs) In today's interview, Mark talks about how more than 90% of the neurons in the brain deploy the little-known molecule glutamate as their neurotransmitter. And glutamate also controls the structure and function of the brain's neuronal networks and mediates many of our human capabilities, including things like learning and memory, creativity, and imagination. But there's also a dark side of glutamate, and Mark shares how glutamate can play a causal role in the development of disorders, including autism, schizophrenia, and epilepsy, as well as diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS. After receiving his doctorate from the University of Iowa, Mark did his postdoc research at Colorado State University and then took a position at the University of Kentucky to establish his own lab and independent research program. In 2000, the National Institute of Aging recruited Mark to head its neuroscience laboratory. He spent about 20 years there and today is on the neuroscience faculty of Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. So in addition to Sculptor and Destroyer, Mark is also the author of The Intermittent Fasting Revolution, The Science of Optimizing Health and Enhancing Performance. And both of these books are published by MIT Press. Before we get to our interview with Mark, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk. And we are especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews. As always, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and other podcast apps for the wittiest and most lavishly praised field reviews to read on STEM Talk. If you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the moniker Slithery Little Snake. I must confess that I was a tad suspicious when I first encountered this review, which is titled, Exactly What I Wanted. But then I read what slithery little snake had to say, and it is indeed a five-star review. It reads, Recently, I began looking for a podcast that talks about STEM topics. I found this one, and for obvious reasons. This show is high quality. The hosts have clearly great knowledge on the topics they are discussing based on their quality and in-depth discussions. In addition, they show a chemistry between themselves and their guests that feels authentic and fun. I have found something to listen to over music or the news during my commute. Well, that's very nice. And thank you, Slithery Little Snake. And I, sometimes I think they put this in there just to hear us say it. <laughs> and thanks to all of our other STEM Talk listeners who helped STEM Talk become such a great success. Okay, and now on to our interview with Dr. Mark Matson. STEM Talk. 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 Hi, welcome to STEM Talk. I'm your host, Don Cornegas. And joining us today is Dr. Mark Matson. Mark, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Don Ken. It's good to be with you again to talk about something completely different. (laughs) And as mentioned, Ken Ford is also joining us. Hello, Don, and great to have you back on the podcast, Mark. Yep, Ken. um, I listen to your podcast regularly. Fantastic. So, Mark, this is your third appearance on the show, and we first had you on the show in 2016, which was episode seven. And then we had you back on the show in 2022 to talk about your book, The Intermittent Fasting Revolution, The Science of Optimizing Health and Enhancing Performance, which had just been released. And both of your previous appearances on STEM Talk focused on intermittent fasting, and for good reason. And you're known as the godfather of intermittent fasting. And the NIH has described you, and this is a quote from them, as one of the world's top experts on the potential cognitive and physical health benefits of intermittent fasting. It's a great, that's a great quote. (laughs) Yeah, that's kind of nice. And they finally put out requests for applications for grant proposals to do clinical trials of intermittent fasting in humans. And now there's over, when I went on clinicaltrials.gov recently, there's over 150 ongoing clinical trials in various 
disease conditions. So that's very uh, satisfying to me for all the work we put into it. Can imagine. That's fantastic. Toward the end of episode 133, you mentioned that you were working on a book about glutamate. You also mentioned that you consider your research on glutamate as your most important work. Given your research track record, that is a strong claim. Can you elaborate on why glutamate is your most important work? I think from a basic science standpoint, it is in in terms of the, the contributions I made to understanding the roles for glutamate in early brain development and then adult plasticity and maybe more importantly for diseases, its role in neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's diseases. So, Mark, not many people know about your work on glutamate. And before we get too far into the interview, I want to point out that your research hasn't been limited to just fasting and glutamate. Your colleagues often describe you as a renaissance man, and and that's because most neuroscientists focus on research on one very specific problem. Yet your research over the decades has spanned brain evolution and development, cognition, the impact of diet and lifestyle and brain health, as well as the pathogenesis and treatment of neurological disorders. And we have to say this is quite unusual. It's my understanding that one reason for your broad scope of your research interests is that you're motivated by how the pieces of the quote-unquote brain puzzle fit together. So can you talk about this motivation and also how it's evolved over the years in your career? Yeah, a, a lot of scientists focus on one highly specific problem, and oftentimes they're so focused on that they don't read the literature in other areas that may be relevant to their own work and how it fits into kind of a bigger picture from standpoint, in the case of neuroscience, of brain evolution to development, function in the adult and what goes wrong in diseases. And I think as science gets more and more specialized, both technically and in terms of specific problems, there are fewer and fewer scientists who are trying to fit the pieces of the puzzle together, which I think is really critical. Absolutely. And it's a, it's a noticeable rarity these days, especially in, in some specific disciplines. Back when you were a postdoc at Colorado State in the late 1980s, you discovered that glutamate sculpts the formation of hippocampal neuronal networks during development. That was a major aha moment for you, I can imagine. I mean, you must have just, you must have been sort of elated. Was that the case? Yeah, it was. It was very interesting. I started out my postdoc studying these highly modal structures at the end of growing axons and dendrites called growth cones. And initially, I was studying the growth of these and and kind of the processes that regulate them in cultured neurons from snail brains. And the reason was the neurons are like 10 times as big in a snail brain as they are in our brains. But then... um, I was more interested in mammalian systems, so I was able to go to a lab and learn how to culture neurons from embryonic rat and mouse brain. And then I started studying there the growth of axons and dendrites. And my mentor, um, Ben Cater, had this hypothesis, actually, that neurotransmitters play a role in brain development before synapses form. And so I started to look at different neurotransmitters, and I found that glutamate, when I added it to these growing neurons, it selectively inhibited the outgrow of the dendrites. It didn't affect the growth of the axons. And then I did further experiments that showed that glutamate released from axon terminals as they grow and come in contact with dendrites during brain development, that glutamate actually kind of stabilizes the dendrites and initiates further events that lead to synapse formation. So the bottom line is that I discovered that uh, glutamate is critical for the formation of synaptic connections between neurons during brain development. That's really interesting. And I, I like the use of the word sculpts. Uh, that, that's a nice description. Yeah, and it really does. It's a, I think it's an apt description. Soon after this discovery, while you were at the University of Kentucky, you discovered that the amyloid beta peptide that accumulates in the brain in Alzheimer's renders neurons vulnerable to excitotoxicity. 
Since these two discoveries, neurologists have now shown that neuronal network hyperexcitability occurs early in Alzheimer's disease and may even contribute to the neuronal degeneration. Can you talk about the significance of these two discoveries in context? And you described these as your two most important discoveries as a researcher. Told us a little about the first one, uh, if you could elaborate a little on the second. Yeah, so turns out... <laughs> When I was studying the effects of glutamate on the formation of synapses in these developing brain neurons, I found that if I add really high amounts of glutamate to the neurons, it kills them. And that's a process called excitotoxicity. So essentially, they're being excited to death. And this involves, in the membrane of neurons, there are receptors for glutamate. Some of those receptors are sodium channels, and when glutamate binds to them, it depolarizes the cell membrane. The sodium rushes in, sodium has a positive charge, so you get a change in potential across the membrane. And then what happens is there's another type of glutamate receptor that's a calcium channel, and that opens, and you get a rushing in of the calcium, and it turns out that if there's too much calcium influx, the cells can't handle it, and it causes free radical production, activation of proteases, and it can kill the cells. So that's excitotoxicity. In the early uh, 1990s, the gene for the amyloid precursor protein was identified, and the, the amino acid sequence of the amyloid beta peptide, which is what accumulates in so-called amyloid plaques in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. The amino acid sequence was determined, and then we could make synthetic peptides, essentially make the amyloid peptide. And so I was one of the first uh, to simply take the amyloid peptide at different concentrations and add it to cultured neurons and see what happened. And I found that very, very high concentrations of the amyloid beta peptide can damage and even kill neurons. But lower concentrations, I've found when I combine it with low concentrations of glutamate, can kill the neurons. So that's actually my most highly cited paper where I actually did the experiments. It's published in 1992, the discovery that the amyloid beta peptide can render neurons vulnerable to excitotoxicity. And that was consistent with clinical data that was it really wasn't talked about much, or a lot of people didn't know about it. But Patients with Alzheimer's disease have a, about a 30-fold increased incidence of epileptic seizures. So I saw that clinical work, and that fit in nicely with the hypothesis that there's a hyperexcitability going on, and glutamate may play a role in combining with the amyloid to damage and, and kill neurons in Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, the only drug that's been shown to slow the progression of Alzheimer's, although it's very, it was statistically significant in the clinical trials. It's not dramatic. It's called memantine. And it's a drug that actually blocks the calcium influx through the one type of glutamate receptor. So that was some clinical evidence that there may be a role for excitotoxicity. The problem with that, though, is that if you give patients too high levels of memantine, that itself will impair learning and memory because glutamate is critical for learning and memory. And uh, uh, we can talk about that, I guess, in a, in a little bit in, you know, glutamate's role in learning and memory. Hmm. So, Mark, you begin in your book, Sculptor and Destroyer, by announcing that you're going to tell the story of glutamate, um, which we've been talking about a little bit already. And you described it as a simple molecule that became a master architect and commander of the brains in all animals. We are going to talk a lot about glutamate today again, as we've already started to. But for listeners who aren't familiar with this molecule, can you touch a little bit on its significance and then also talk about how it controls the formation of nerve cell networks as the brain develops in the womb? Yeah, so glutamate or glutamic acid is an amino acid, one of the 20 amino acids that are building blocks of proteins. So I guess a lot of biochemists know glutamate from that standpoint. It also, before it was discovered to be a neurotransmitter, was shown to play a role in energy metabolism. It's involved in what's called the TCA cycle, energy metabolism. And it's one of the simplest amino acids. It has five carbons and a couple oxygens and a, a nitrogen. All amino acids have this nitrogen NH2 group. So it's been around a long time. I 
you know, I did some reading. There's even some evidence that glutamate be one of the first kind of organic molecules to play a role in the evolution of life. And this has to do with the famous experiments of Stanley Miller, who tried to mimic the early life conditions by having some methane and oxygen and then some carbon, small, simple carbon source. And he exposed it to ultraviolet light, you know, which is kind of mimicking the sun hitting the, I guess, primordial soup, if you will. And he found that several you know, amino acids were produced under those conditions, including uh, glutamate. And then you also asked about its role in, in development. And so I kind of mentioned that. So what, what happens, it's concentrated in high amounts in certain neurons, the glutamatergic neurons, which comprise more than 90% of all neurons in the brain, uh, use glutamate as their neurotransmitter. Other neurons use transmitters such as GABA, inhibitory transmitter, or even less prevalent are neurons that use dopamine or serotonin or acetylcholine. And the, in the adult brain, the core circuitry throughout the brain, all regions of the cerebral cortex, except the lobe, frontal lobe, prefrontal cortex, motor cortex, doesn't matter which brain region. The core circuitry is excitatory glutamatergic neurons and inhibitory GABAergic neurons. The glutamatergic neurons often have very long axons that can go between brain regions or even between hemispheres, uh, one hemisphere to the other. So pretty much all the white matter tracks these myelinated axons that can conduct impulses at high velocity. Those are all glutamatergic neurons. The inhibitory neurons don't project their axons very far. They only modulate the glutamate neurons within a brain region, not between brain regions. And then finally, the serotonin or dopamine neurons, their cell bodies are located in more primitive brain regions than the cerebral cortex, such as the brain stem and midbrain. And they project their axons actually throughout the brain and impinge upon glutamatergic neurons and GABAergic neurons. So this is why one of the main reasons I say in the, the subtitle of my book that glutamate's the most important neurotransmitter in the brain, the only way that these other transmitters affect brain function at all, all our behaviors, doesn't matter what we're doing, moving, talking, thinking, uh, emotions. Uh, the only way serotonin and dopamine, for example, affect our mood and behavior is by modulating the ongoing activity of the glutamatergic neurons uh, in relatively subtle but important ways. Hmm. That's interesting. You mentioned that more than 90% of the neurons in the brain use glutamate as their neurotransmitter. And um, you write in the book, and I've experienced this myself, you write in the book that when you ask physicians and other people to discuss a neurotransmitter or to name one, hardly anyone ever mentions glutamate. It just doesn't pop into one's mind when you think of neurotransmitters. That's interesting, and I wonder why that is. Yeah, I think it's uh, that in popular culture, and, and even actually in, from the standpoint of, for example, a psychiatrist treating a patient, we hear about dopamine because of its, like the pleasure neurotransmitter, and it's involved in addiction, you know, get this dopamine surge and so on, which it's true. And there are drugs that modulate dopamine in ways that can help patients with some disorders, schizophrenia and so on. And similarly, uh, with serotonin, we hear about this and psychiatrists prescribe based on serotonin, and also norepinephrine. So the modern antidepressant, well, all the antidepressant drugs actually increase the amount of serotonin at synapses. And so I think that's why we hear about those other neurotransmitters mm -hmm. and psychiatrists are most familiar with those. Basic neuroscientists, if you ask them, they will, most of them will say glutamate is the most important neurotransmitter. You know, I think that's, I think you're probably right about the phenomena of people not identifying it. It might be because the role is so pervasive and it essentially enables the others that the lack of specificity, uh, you sort of mentioned other neurotransmitters ha in having particular drugs that 
might be helpful in the context of a specific disorder, whereas a glutamate has just an absolutely fundamental role that I learned from your book. So th that could be part of the reason. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. You mentioned it briefly earlier, you know, and your book title reflects this as well. There's a, what you might think of as a dark side to glutamate as well. Uh, you mentioned, mentioned it briefly earlier. Could you talk a little bit about that? Okay, it's best easy to understand maybe from the standpoint of epileptic seizures. So during an epileptic seizure, neurons in a bunch of neurons, hundreds, hundreds of thousands probably of neurons in certain brain region, they start to fire very fast in an uncontrolled manner. So that's what's happening during seizure. The, the neurons are just firing like crazy. They're not being well controlled by the inhibitory GABAergic neurons. And if they continue to be activated at those abnormally high levels, that can kill the neurons. In fact, in anim the animal models of epilepsy that we use in the lab, the most common ones anyway, we administer certain chemicals that activate glutamate receptors excessively, and they cause seizures. And some of these actually have very interesting history in terms of their discovery. One of them I can talk about is called domoic acid, similar to glutamate, except uh, one thing I haven't mentioned is that normally when glutamate is released from a neuron in a synapse, it's released in this highly confined region of the synapse. And after it's released, most of it is actually removed, taken up into either the neuron that released it or these other type of cells called astrocytes that are surrounding the synapse. So there are specific proteins in the membrane of the neuron and astrocytes that are called glutamate transporters that take the glutamate away from the receptor so that the you get this transient activation of the receptor at kind of low to moderate levels. And with epilepsy, then you get this excessive outpouring of glutamate at levels that can't be managed effectively by the glutamate transporters. Demoic acid, in contrast to glutamate, is not able to be taken up by the glutamate transporters. So it stays at high levels and it just keeps activating the glutamate receptors. There was this incident in Canada a few decades ago where some people who had eaten at a restaurant developed seizures and also amnesia, and their short-term short memory was severely impaired. So this happened you know, within a day or two after they'd eaten at this restaurant. And so this was investigated, and it turns out they all ate the same, ordered the same thing. It was shellfish. And what happened was they had like a red tide year in the region where they were harvesting these shellfish. So these algae, uh, turns out, uh, under those conditions, el so the shellfish feed on the algae. The algae had produced and concentrated high levels of domoic acid. Then the shellfish ate them and it concentrated in them. And then the people ate the shellfish and the domoic acid damaged and killed neurons in their hippocampus, a brain region critical for learning and memory. And, you know, and actually, I think at least one of them died, actually. Wow. From this. So, um, yeah, if we give domoic acid to rats or mice, and we can, of course, adjust the concentration so they don't, don't die, it will cause epileptic seizures and, and actually can kill neurons and cause memory impairment. In fact, the, the first model, it, you know, the, our intermittent fasting work, the first animal model where we fought, found that intermittent fasting protected neurons was in a neurotoxin epilepsy model. We found that the intermittent fasting suppressed the seizures and prevented the, the memory impairment. Is that thought to be related to the same mechanism that the ketogenic diet suppresses seizures? Yeah, it's very likely that the ketones, you know, produced during the fasting are contributing to this neuroprotective mm -hmm. effect. Yeah, one would think so. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's on my mind, I'll mention one little thing too about following up on Ken's point about the, the intermittent the ketone. We also found in, in one of the last original research articles that we published before I retired from the NIH, we had a postdoc who he put mice on intermittent fasting or not for different time periods, one week, two weeks, a month. And then he 
euthanized the animals, took out their hippocampus, put electrodes in glutamatergic neurons in the hippocampus. And then what he recorded was the relative level of inhibition of the glutamatergic neurons by GABA neurons. So essentially measuring uh, indirectly the release of GABA from synapses, something we call inhibitory postsynaptic current, currents. The, actually, chloride, it's an interesting physiology, but the GABA receptors are chloride channels. Chloride has a negative charge. So when the GABA receptors are activated, this negatively charged chloride moves into the neuron and, and it will suppress depolarization. It hyperpolarizes the neuron so it can counteract glutamate. So anyway, bottom line is that Yang Lu, who did this study, found that animals adapted to intermittent fasting, there's enhanced GABAergic inhibition. So there's this may also play an important role in the protection against seizures by intermittent fasting. Wow, that's really interesting and mm -hmm. and on the surface makes makes sense once you say it. And that, yeah. that sounds like quite an elaborate experiment. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a Highly technical experiments that I couldn't do myself, actually. So, Mark, one thing that I found fascinating is that we'll probably never know where in the universe that glutamate originated. And you pointed out that it was pro possibly here on Earth, but maybe not. Can you expand on that concept a little bit? Well, you've, you've all heard of Carl Sagan and his important roles in the probe expeditions of to, what, I can't remember, Mars and Venus or whatever. And there's a lot of interest in this exoplanets and idea of life on other planets or moons within our solar system or outside the solar system. There's a moon of Saturn called Titan, and its atmosphere is mostly nitrogen with small amounts of methane and ethane. And it's thought that it's in its atmosphere, it has kind of a reddish haze that may be a result of these uh, organic molecules falling to the moon's surface. And so scientists have tried to mimic the atmosphere of Titan molecularly and then exposing, I mentioned Stanley Miller exposing to ultraviolet radiation and found that you can produce glutamate under those conditions. So that could be that there's glutamate, very likely, I'd be surprised if there isn't in other places outside of Earth. Since it's one of the simplest amino acids, one would think that during evolution of organic molecules, it started with simple molecules and then built upon that to the very complex, you know, proteins and nucleic acids and membrane lipids and all the more complex molecules. Uh, glutamate is very simple. And it's interesting that it turned out to be a very important molecule for intercellular communication, you know, probably undoubtedly and that's evidence for before there were organisms with nervous systems, there were glutamate was used for communication between cells. And I have a section, the first chapter, or the, I guess the second chapter is on evolution. And there's evidence for glutamate playing roles in the growth of plants and their responses to being chewed upon by insects, uh, the growth of uh, of slime molds and yeah, so it's undoubtedly glutamate was playing a role in in the development and function of organisms way before there were organisms with nervous systems. Hmm. This is probably a good time to discuss the historical perspective and how up until the 1940s, most researchers ignored the possibility that glutamate might be a neural transmitter. But during World War II, a Japanese professor started investigating glutamate. Can you talk about how his experiments provided the first evidence that glutamate could excite neurons and the significance of this finding? Yeah, this is an interesting story. Um, a professor in, in Keio University in Tokyo, Takashi Hayashi, and this was during World War II, so he didn't have to go fight in the war. Uh, that's one benefit of being scientist. In fact, <laughs> It's interesting. Um, so the NIH in the 1950s and 60s, maybe into the 70s, many of the top scientists in the United States were at the NIH, did their research at NIH, and several got Nobel Prizes. And the reason was uh, when the war started and the draft started, they were they didn't have to go fight because they were scientists and 
you know, we wanted, and other countries wanted scientists still working on important problems. But anyway, so Hayashi, um, he did a lot of research on dogs, and he was doing kind of, in a way, kind of playing around, looking at effects of adding different specific chemicals to the brains of dogs directly to the, he would, you know, anesthetize them, then make a hole in their skull. And turns out the brain, there are no pain receptors in the brain. So actually you can, if you want to, you can probe around in a brain of an animal and they won't have pain. But anyway, he added glutamate to the brains and found that it caused seizures. And he was adding very high levels of glutamate that the brain would never be exposed to otherwise. And that was really the first evidence that glutamate might play a role in influencing the excitability of neurons. And then it wasn't until later that scientists started actually looking in, in more highly controlled experiments of glutamate's effects and eventually showing that glutamate is concentrated in neurons and released from axon terminals or presynaptic endings and is actually a neurotransmitter. Hayashi showed that glutamate was sufficient to excite neurons, but that doesn't show that it's a neurotransmitter. This could be just a spurious finding. So the really the key development was when scientists uh, were able to make specific glutamate receptor antagonist chemicals, chemicals that block the ability of glutamate to bind to and activate its receptor. And then experiments were done, uh, electrophysiology and so on, and even looking at learning and memory, for example, and showing that these glutamate receptors antagonists can block synaptic transmission and impair learning and memory. While the brain represents just 2% of a person's total body weight, it accounts for roughly 20% of the body's energy use, or about 400 calories of energy during a 24-hour period. Can you discuss the role that glutamate plays in the utilization of energy in the brain? Absolutely. So I mentioned that more than 90% of the neurons are glutamatergic. It's the excitatory transmitter. And so what this means is that most of the energy, the glucose or ketones that are ultimately converted to ATP, most of that energy is being used by glutamatergic neurons, well more than 90%. One way that people look at neural network activity in the brains of humans is called functional magnetic resonance imaging. And it's essentially measuring blood flow. And there's a tight coupling of neural activity to blood flow. So it's kind of similar to muscle cells. When you exercise, the blood vessels, arteries going to the muscle dilate and get more blood to the muscle because the muscle cells need more energy to keep them going. It's the same with the brain. When the neurons are active, when they're exercising, they need more energy and, and use more energy. So essentially, when all these now thousands and thousands of published articles looking at functional magnetic resonance imaging, neural network activity in brains and in normal people while they're doing whatever, learning and memory tasks or in disease states. Essentially, what's being looked at there is the activity of glutamatergic neurons because the blood flow is an indirect measure of that activity. So, Mark, in the first half of your book, you walk readers through the way that glutamate controls the structure of neuronal networks in the brain. And it also plays a major role in not only mediating the brain's ability to learn and memorize, but also has a role in inspiring creativity and imagination, which is really cool. So can you give us an overview of this essential role that glutamate plays in our lives? Yes. So because more than 90% of the neurons in the brain use glutamate and more than 90% of the synapses are glutamatergic synapses. And that comes out to about, there's about 100 billion neurons in the brain total and about a thousand times more synapses. So a trillion synapses. So there's a lot of um, glutamatergic synapses. So when we learn and remember things, essentially what's happening is we receive sensory input from our eyes, our ears, our nose. And this information, no matter which of our senses it's coming from, it's very interesting. It initially goes into certain regions of the cerebral cortex, and then it all funnels in 
to this brain region called the hippocampus, which considerable evidence suggests where memories are formed, initially anyway, they may, and then later there's this interesting evidence that they can be transferred to other brain regions and stored long-term there. But for example, if we were walking in the woods and we've never seen a bear before or heard a bear before, and a bear walks out of the wood trail ahead of us and roars, then and we remember that. So what's happening is you're getting a pairing of a sight and a sound, the bear and its sound, at the same time. And that information is converging on certain neurons and synapses in the hippocampus. And when that convergent glutamatergic excitation of the same neurons is occurring and so in space and time, what happens is there's actually a physical change at the synapse. Uh, synapses can get bigger, or in some cases, even new synapses can form. So it's thought that memories are based on this structural change resulting from the pairing of information coming in in space and time. Yeah, and glutamate's critical for that. If you, in animal studies with mice or rats, for example, when you teach them water maze uh, or other types of learning and memory paradigms, if you give them drugs that block glutamate receptors, that impairs their short-term memory. And there's been this has been intensively studied what's happening at synapses in the hippocampus. And uh, there's actually thousands of papers on this process. It's called long-term potentiation of glutamatergic synapses that is thought to be the basis of learning and memory. And glutamate receptors are key to that. Mm -hmm. So is it fair to say that you would have not been able to write your book without glutamate? I know you, we all depend on glutamate, but it struck me that writing a book would be just a great example <laughs> of such an event. Yes, for sure. And we wouldn't be doing any of us what we're doing now <laughs> without glutamate. So sure. if, if it's not there, you're dead. Let alone not writing a book. Yeah. But, but I think the key point there is that it is essentially involved in, in the specific details of what goes on in writing, right? I've, when I wrote this book, An Intermittent Fasting Revolution, you know, most of it's from my memory. I guess sit down and write because I know this stuff so well because I've worked on it for four decades. You know, so in that case, I'm recalling memories and, and trying to come up with ideas, you know, each paragraph and how they fit into each section and how it all kind of fits together. That's always kind of in, I guess, kind of the ongoing in your mind, in my mind. And then, you know, focus on the specific and kind of, kind of keep going back mm -hmm. and forth between putting specific details in and trying to make it fit in a logical way uh, all together and tell a story. Now, the third book, which I'm working on now, it's on something called hormesis or adaptive stress responses, and there are points of that in kind of all realms of biology and medicine. That's a little bit different. I, I'm having, it's harder for me to write because I know quite a bit about it, but not enough to just sit down and, and write. So anyway, I'm probably taxing glutamate synapses a little more <laughs> heavily in this new book. Yes, it, writing any book, no matter how much one knows about the subject, is a creative act and, and uh, it requires uh, not just putting back the knowledge that you've learned, but also sort of a creative activity. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research organization investigating a broad range of topics aimed at understanding and extending human cognition, locomotion, health span, resilience, and performance 
in later chapters of The Sculptor and Destroyer, you dive into the dark side of glutamate and just subtle aberrancies and the activity of neurons that deploy glutamate may result in behavioral disorders such as autism, schizophrenia, chronic anxiety, and depression. And we've talked about some of this already a little bit. But the real meat of the book explains how glutamate can overly excite neurons to the point that it leads to a wide range of disorders. And that includes things like epilepsy, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, ALS, and even Huntington's disease. So it would be great if you could explain how aberrant glutamatergic neurotransmission is a fundamental feature of so many different neurological disorders. I think that'd be great for our listeners to hear. Yeah, I talked about Alzheimer's and how the the amyloid protein may render neurons vulnerable to excitotoxicity. Uh, I didn't mention that the mechanism we think is actually this amyloid peptide causes oxidative stress and something called lipid peroxidation in the membrane of the neuron. And then that impairs, for example, glutamate transporter protein, as well as these ion pumps for sodium and calcium that are ATP dependent pumps in the membrane that get the sodium and calcium back out of the neuron after it's been stimulated by glutamate. So the the amyloid by renders the neurons vulnerable to excitotoxicity. In Parkinson's, the evidence comes from, from a number of different angles, but one major one is that there's evidence that early on in Parkinson's disease, the dopaminergic neurons, their mitochondria, have problems producing ATP, and also they seem to be producing more free radicals than normal. So there's an interesting story here. There's a neurologist, Bill Langston, out at a a clinic, a neurology clinic in California. And one day he he went into the clinic and he had one of his uh, residents come to him and tell him that he was seeing a patient. The patient was 30 some years old and he was exhibiting symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And moreover, this happened all of a sudden. A few days before that, he was perfectly fine. And then over the ensuing few days, they had several more of these young people come in with symptoms, you know, tremor, uh, rigidity, and kind of the classic signs of Parkinson's. What happened, they did some detective work, and it actually law enforcement was involved. And what happened was all of these people had had the same batch of synthetic heroin. And then chemists looked at their, they were able to get, actually get batches of that heroin. And there's this chemical they identified in this batch. They, the, the people were doing the synthesis screwed up is the bottom line. And there's this chemical called MPTP in, in that batch of heroin. And it turns out that's what caused their Parkinson-like problem and degeneration of their dopaminergic neurons. And then further work was done to show that this MPTP inhibits the electron transport chain in mitochondria. And the reason the dopaminergic neurons degenerate is that the MPTP is selectively taken up into the dopaminergic neurons via a dopamine transport protein in the 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 axons of the dopaminergic neurons. So that was kind of a really and that and now that MPTP is used in rats, mice, and monkeys to cause selective degeneration of dopamine neurons and hmm. and test various things. And then it turns out that MPTP in cultured neurons can render them vulnerable to excitotoxicity. So it's kind of a simple thing that. This chemical is impairing the mitochondria. The mitochondria can't produce as much ATP as they should be producing. The neurons need the ATP to fuel the ion pumps that pump sodium and calcium back out after the cell is excited by glutamate. So again, what happens is that the cells are accumulating too much sodium and calcium that's caused by glutamate, uh, and it's not being removed, and they die. Then in the case of ALS, there's another very interesting story. There was this, uh, on the, these islands by Guam, the natives there, there's a high incidence of what's called ALS Parkinson's dementia of Guam. Of course, uh, during World War II, the United States like took over Guam and some islands around there. And then some neurologists found out about this and started studying it. And over the over the de- years and decades, 
these islands became kind of modernized and the diet of the people changed. Some of the people moved to the United States. And so this syndrome, this ALS Parkinson's dementia disappeared. And so this one investigator, Peter Spencer out at, I think he was in Portland now, he found that, so the, the diet of these natives included bat, <laughs> bats, these fruit bats. And it turns out the main food of these bats was this was a fruit, and that fruit had high concentrations of an excitotoxin, a chemical that activates glutamate receptors in it. It's kind of similar to demoic acid, and uh, that was sufficient to cause the degeneration of the the motor neurons, uh, which is what de in, they're in the spinal cord and they degenerate in ALS. And there's other evidence. A colleague of mine at Johns Hopkins had a other evidence that there's problems in properly regulating glutamate, specifically impairment in glutamate transporter in motor neurons and ALS, and that may, and astrocytes too, and that may contribute to some cases of ALS. Really interesting, Mark. Um, it's a good explanation. You know, you mentioned it obliquely earlier, but I'd like to ask you directly about the role of aging in making neurons vulnerable to excitotoxicity. Is there a specific aspect of aging, or does it have to do with general decline of mitochondrial function and, and the like? I think there's very solid evidence that there's multiple problems that are going on in cells throughout the body and brain during aging. One is, is problems with mitochondrial function. Another is impaired ability to remove dysfunctional mitochondria mm -hmm. or potentially pathogenic proteins like alpha-synuclein and Parkinson's or maybe even amyloid and Alzheimer's. So that falls under the category of impaired autophagy, mm -hmm. which many of your listeners may have heard about before. In addition, there's accumulation of oxidatively damaged proteins nucleic acids and lipids that occurs, and also impaired ability of cells to repair damage, so to repair mm -hmm. DNA mutations or you know, other kinds of repair. In the case of neurons, there's an impaired ability to maintain their ion homeostasis, which I kind of mentioned throughout. Mm -hmm. So there tends to be a overloading of calcium that occurs. Yeah. So all these things together are not good. You know, we, you and I are, are declining now. We don't like to think we are, but uh, it's going on. You know, I, I'm concerned about, I, I think everybody, I don't want to talk political and but this is more of a general thing that, you know, people, when they get in their seventies and eighties, it's just, this is aging happens to everyone. And, you know, they've accumulated knowledge, a lot of knowledge, but they're, less creative and less productive. It's just the way it happens. You know, I, there's a, I was at National Institute on Aging for 20 years, and, you know, there's this concern about ageism. But on the other hand, <laughs> you know, we, we know that things decline. I, as you know, I think, you know, so I used to run a lot, and then I did mountain biking. I had an accident uh, four years ago, had multiple surgeries, a lot of issues with that. And I'm sure the reason I had the accident was I'm getting older. My reaction time is getting slower. And, you know, even though we'd like to think we are or can perform as well as we did when we we're younger, we can't. And I think that's a reality that we all have to deal with. So the best we can do is try to slow the aging process through exercise, moderation and calorie, calorie intake, maybe intermittent fasting. Keeping your mind active, it turns out that just like exercise is good for your muscle, keeping engaged in intellectual challenges as you age is good for your brain. There's really good epidemiological evidence and the, the kind of animal data support this, that if you keep your mind active, socially engaged, things what you and I and Dawn are doing now, as we age, this is actually good. This is a good stress, uh, something that's called a U stress or good mm -hmm. stress. This is a comes to the aspect of hormesis and kind of challenging your cells intermittently, kind of enhances their repair mechanisms and enhance autophagy, bolsters mitochondrial function, etc. So, mm -hmm. in the case of neurons, you know, glutamate is good as long as you know released intermittently and in 
kind of evolutionarily normal levels. Yes, um, that long list of the deprivations associated with aging, although somewhat depressing, um, um, <laughs> you know, I, w- I was particularly interested in the part of, uh, relating to glutamate. Yeah, yeah. So all of these, if, if, if you experimentally, if you impair mitochondrial function, like I mentioned with MPTP, or there's other ways to do that, if you impair autophagy by, for example, there's a lot of way, interesting things you can do with that. For example, rapamycin, mm-hmm. listeners have probably heard of that. Yeah, many of the listeners uh, use rapamycin. Yeah. Hundreds, I'm sure. If you impair DNA repair, you know, any of those things will, if you subject cells to high levels of oxidative stress, all of those will make the neurons vulnerable to excitotoxicity. So I guess in summary, many, maybe most of the age-related changes that occur in neurons are changes that will make them more vulnerable to excitotoxicity. That's a good answer. Thank you. You had a paper back in 2018 that discussed how the incidence of seizures is higher in older people than in middle-aged people. Can you walk us through how some of the features of an aging brain can stimulate the development of seizures? You talked earlier, just just a moment ago, about excitotoxicity in the aging brain, so I assume that this is connected to the increased rate of seizures. But could you tell us a little bit about your paper and, and what you learned? Yeah, so in addition to the changes mentioned aging, which makes neurons more prone to hyperexcitability. Turns out that there's a decline in the, the functionality and, and maybe even the survival or the number of GABAergic inhibitory neurons that occurs with aging and more so in Alzheimer's disease. And it turns out that these GABAergic inhibitory neurons, they have a very high firing rate. So they're much more active under normal conditions than our glutamatergic neurons. And that's what constrains the activity of the glutamatergic neurons and prevents seizures. And these inhibitory GABAergic neurons are loaded with mitochondria, which kind Mm. of makes sense because they're so active, they have to have more energy, more ATP than do the glutamatergic neurons. So increasing number of studies suggest that with aging and much more more so in mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's, there's a decrement in the function of these GABAergic neurons that may result in hyperexcitability and increased proneness to seizures. So that begs the question of, hey, what if we use drugs that activate GABA receptors? You know, might they mitigate some of the effects of aging or Alzheimer's? And in animal models, yeah, to some extent, the Another interesting thing, and in Alzheimer's, uh, even in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, they have high levels of anxiety. Uh, we can test their anxiety levels in, in certain ways. And this, we think, has to do with a decrement in the GABA inhibitory tone. The first drugs used to treat anxiety disorders in humans were drugs that activate GABA receptors. Valium, I don't know if Mm -hmm. your listeners, uh, some of them are old enough to have heard about that, diazepam or Valium. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, some interesting uh, clinical trials going on. Michaela Gallagher at Hopkins, for example, had one study where she's seeing whether drugs that inhibit the glutamatergic neurons, either by activating GABA receptors at at levels that don't cause any major side effects. Or another approach is to use actually low doses of drugs used to treat epileptic seizures. So these are drugs that inhibit the sodium channels and kind of Mm -hmm. lessen the depolarization of the neurons when they're stimulated by glutamate. And I mentioned the intermittent fasting enhances the GABA inhibitory transmission. Physical exercise, actually, there's some evidence for that. So, uh, you know, this may be why caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, in part, can keep the brain functioning longer, better. Here at IHMC, we often work with military populations who have traumatic brain injuries. Can you talk about how glutamate leaks out following a traumatic brain injury and the effect that this then causes subsequent to the injury? Yeah, um, 
in traumatic brain injury, there's physical shearing of tissue in the brain and membranes of neurons get damaged and the glutamate can leak out. So I mentioned that glutamate is at high concentrations up to millimolar levels inside of neurons. Normally outside of the neurons, it's very, very low negligible levels uh, in except at synapses. So what happens is then the trauma to the nerve cells causes glutamate to leak out and then it can overexcite neurons in that region where the tissue is damaged. There are some published papers in animal models of traumatic brain injury where glutamate receptor blockers can lessen the brain damage and improve the outcome. I'm not aware of clinical trials in in humans yet. So that's kind of the the status of that. And similar with stroke, when when one has a stroke, the blood supply is shut off to the region of the brain supplied by the, the artery that has the clot in it. And so the neurons don't get oxygen and glucose or ketones. And so there's kind of an energy failure. And then they can still continue to be excited by glutamate. And you get excitotoxicity because there's low ATP levels, like like an energy deficit. Mm. That's also probably occurring to some extent with traumatic brain injury. Mm, That makes sense. So, Mark, you have a chapter in the book titled Eve of Destruction, and this chapter explores the role of glutamate in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, as well as less common neurodegenerative disorders, such as Huntington's disease and ALS. So one in every three people older than 65 will die with Alzheimer's. So it would be great if you could describe the symptoms of this devastating disease and how that leads to this inexorable decline in the ability to remember experiences. Yeah, the the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is impaired short-term memory. So you can't remember where you were, what you did, or who you talked to, you know, a few hours ago, for example. Um, So my mother died young, actually. She was 67. She was a heavy smoker and overweight and had a stroke. So then my father, and we lived on a farm. I grew up in a farm in southern Minnesota, and my father and me and my grandpa actually trained and raced harness horses, standard breads, trotters, and pacers. Hmm. We had a training track on the farm. And so, you know, when my mom died, all the kids had, weren't there anymore. So my dad was living alone. He still had a few horses. And when he was about 80 years old, so I'm in Maryland, he's back in Minnesota, and I talked to him every week or every couple of weeks. And I started to notice that during the phone conversation, he would ask me the same question more than once. And this is kind of a clear sign of problem with short-term memory, right? Mm-hmm. He, he didn't remember. He'd always already asked me that question. But otherwise, he was functioning pretty well, you know, in his daily routine and so on. He was physically active. But we took him into the Mayo Clinic. I, I just, I'm from Rochester, Minnesota. I went to Mayo High School. My father was actually prosecuting attorney for the county there, Olmstead County. But a lot of the kids in my high school were doctor's kids, and I was in all the AP course. But anyway, Ron Peterson is a neurologist that's done a lot of basic work, human work on mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. And he was Ronald Reagan's doctor. So my sister and me and my brother, we set up an appointment for my dad with Ron Peterson, we went in, he did all the cognitive testing they do. And, you know, his, his scores on the cognitive testing put him in the, in the range for mild to moderate dementia. And so he was diagnosed with probable Alzheimer's disease. We had to take his car keys away. Mm-hmm. That was a, the first thing that, that Ron Peterson told us that is he, he asked, is he still driving? And you got to take his car keys away because now he's diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. If you let him drive and he gets in an accident, there could be some you know, legal issues around that. So, But anyway, then um, my brother moved up there and lived with him for, so this was when he was like 83, for about five years. And he, we took him in every year to the clinic. He got the cognitive testing. He got MRI. They took cerebral spinal fluid. He was part of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center there. And he passed away when he was 90. and. So again, I'm in this field. I know the people. So Ron had his uh, brain sent to Dennis Dixon down in 
Jacksonville, Mayo Clinic Jacksonville. He's mm-hmm. a famous neuropathologist. And he did the, the histology, looked at my dad's brain. And the bottom line is my dad didn't have Alzheimer's by the normal criteria. He he had some amyloid accumulation, but not not dramatic. He had some of the so-called tau neurofibrillary tangles. Again, they didn't quite reach the criteria for Alzheimer's disease. And then he had some other problems, some changes that are kind of seen in frontotemporal dementia. And so he was diagnosed with his mixed dementia. What he did have is massive loss or death of hippocampal neuron, kind of generally similar to what you'd see in like that person who died from the domoic acid intoxication mm. in Canada. They looked at his brain, actually, and had massive loss. So very likely excitotoxicity killed his neurons. Now, my own, you know, so the question is why? Well, as Don mentioned, that if you get to 80, 80 years old, you have a high probability, close to 50% of developing dementia before you die. So... When my mom died, I mentioned my dad was all alone on the farm. So I think one general thing, he wasn't getting, and he didn't do a lot of reading. He, after he retired from law, so he never read like a lot of novels and stuff. And so he was mainly just, you know, walking around the farm, not interacting with people. And, uh, you know, so I think he wasn't getting a lot of intellectual stimulation during that couple decades, mm-hmm. you know, almost decade and a half. Um, yeah, so that's his story and my my story and experience with it. And it's very interesting. Were there any sign of a vascular component to his issue? Ah, uh, yeah, there was some some vascular changes too, and that's a good point because as we age, you know, everybody will get some atherosclerosis to various extents. There's kind of so-called hardening of the arteries, mm-hmm. arteriosclerosis, calcium accumulation. Yeah, so he did also have some vascular issues. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. It seems to be often called Alzheimer's, but often it's you know sort of as you said a cluster of issues, including yeah. vascular issues. And that you know the, the diagnosis is made at autopsy based on these neurologists got together a long time ago and said, okay, if there's so many amyloid plaque and so many tau neurofibrillary mm-hmm. tangles. If it's that or above, we'll call it Alzheimer's. If it's less, we'll say this is dementia, but not Alzheimer's. So it's that. I think that was kind of a bad idea in a way. Yeah. To to make that kind of arbitrary criteria. Probably premature as well as yeah. there's still much unknown about about that. Yeah. You know, you've been quoted as saying that. In your view, everyone is at risk for Alzheimer's, not just people, you know, with APOE4 allele or, you know, or some special population, but essentially everyone is at risk. Why is that? It's because uh, aging is the major risk factor, and we all age. And, you know, you mentioned APOE4. There are probably other genetic factors. There's actually a few that there's people are providing evidence for, you know. So we all have different genetic uh, constitution, depending on what we inherited from our parents, we live all live in different environments. So you, we can't do much about our genes, maybe in the future. But the only thing we can do is modify our environment with known risk factors. Mm. So being sedentary, overeating, not keeping your brain stimulated and socially engaged, those are the big three. So, but even that, there's no guarantee. Mm. There's no guarantees in any aspect of human life, it seems. You mentioned aging as a strong risk factor. It seems to be the primary risk factor for almost everything. Not everything, but almost everything. And I've sort of come to the conclusion over some time, maybe because I have been aging for 70, almost 70 laps around the sun. But, um, you know, I think we focus not enough on health span and on reducing the biological age, if you can, if you understand what I mean, as opposed to yeah. whack-a-mole. Uh, by that time, it's almost too late. You know, I, I saw a paper where they were talking about if you cured cancer and heart disease and the effect it would have on the life expectancy of a 50-year-old woman in the United States. That was the sample they used for the statistics was this sort of average person at 50 years old with no specific disease. And it was something like four years. It wasn't long. 
Yeah, that's and am- that's uh, amazing. And if you shift aging just a little, the uh, the effect would be much greater. So I that you mentioned aging in the context of Alzheimer's. We everyone's so concerned about APOE4, and that obviously makes sense. But age itself seems to drive so much. I agree a hundred percent. Alzheimer's is a good example where you know a targeted approach to trying to stop or you know have a major effect in slowing the progression of all the clinical trials have failed miserably. Mm-hmm. Literally billions of dollars put into it, and you know this is a whole nother podcast. But our whole healthcare system is screwed up. When, it is for sure. Yeah, in multiple ways, and I often worry that the cure will be worse than the disease. Yeah, I, I don't know about this GLP-1 receptor agonist. Uh, they seem pretty safe so far, but... It's an experiment done on a massive scale with very poor controls. I mean, if you think about it, there are literally millions and millions of people clamoring for that. Yeah, we did a lot of work on this. It was actually initially developed, Xendin-4, Xenotide, the first one. It was a diabetes at, drug, right? Yeah, it was developed at where I was by... Mm-hmm a colleague of mine, Josephine Egan, and we did a lot of work on its neuroprotective effect that led to uh, some clinical trials in Parkinson's patients. There are studies in humans that suggest a potential benefit of ketone esters in people at risk of cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's. Can you walk us through this research quickly, just a high-level summary? And um, by the way, uh, Stephen Kunain has done some great work related to this, and he was our guest on episode 59 of STEM Talk. Yeah, I had Stephen also on my Brain Ponderings podcast. I had him twice to talk about ketones and the brain and Alzheimer's disease. So where do ketones come from? When your glycogen stores in your liver are depleted, which is glucose, then fatty acids are released from fat cells into the blood, and those fatty acids go into the liver, and in the liver cells, these fatty acids that come from triglycerides or diglycerides. The fatty acids are converted to two ketones, beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. Those ketones then are actively moved into cells throughout the body and brain, including neurons. There are specific transporters on the membrane of cells called monocarboxylic acid transporters, or MCTs, that actively move. So Steve Conan, he had evidence using PET imaging where he essentially took radio-labeled acetoacetate, a ketone, and radio-labeled glucose, injected them into patients that either were or were not on a ketogenic diet, so high-fat, low-carb diets where you get elevation in circulating acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. And so he essentially looked at the uptake of either glucose or the ketones into the neurons. And he found that when the people <coughs> were eating carbs, the neurons use mainly glucose. When they're eating fats, and he also actually had data from a couple people with fasting, the neurons use ketones. So the point is, the neurons can switch between glucose and ketones. It turns out that during normal aging, and much more so in mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease, neurons have a problem taking up glucose. It seems like the glucose transporter in their membrane is not functioning well. It could be because they aren't responding to insulin. They're developing insulin resistance. So insulin, when it binds to the receptor, it causes increased uh, uptake of glucose into the cells. So either by impaired insulin sensitivity or maybe a problem with the glucose transporter itself, neurons cannot take up and use glucose in cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's. So Steve Conane is, and also Dimitrios Kapagianis, a neurologist that was in my lab, actually. He's still there after I retired. He is also doing a clinical trial of ketone ester in patients with mild, early mild Alzheimer's disease. We'll see what happens. So the prediction is because the neurons seem to be able to still use ketones, mm-hmm. uh, and we, with Richard, in collaboration with Richard Veach, that the studies were done in my lab, we showed 10 years ago that in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, putting ketone ester in their diet protected the neurons and preserved learning and memory ability. So that was kind of the preclinical study that partly was the basis for the ongoing clinical trials that Kunain and mm-hmm. Kapagianis are doing. Yeah, so you, the ketone ester increases blood flow to the brain as well, which is interesting and could have a benefit. Yeah, yeah, and 
Yeah, the ketones are very interesting. There's a lot of evidence they have signaling functions. They, yes. Mm -hmm. They can affect gene expression through various ways. We did a little work, for example, I haven't mentioned this yet, but there's a protein called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's produced when neurons are active. It's important for learning and memory. It's critical for the growth of dendrites and the formation of new synapses between neurons. And also it protects neurons against stress. And we found that beta-hydroxybutyrate induces the expression of BDNF, actually increases gene transcription of BDNF. Uh, we identified which transcription factor was involved. So this is another interesting way that, you know, now we've mentioned ketones are energy source. You mentioned it can increase blood flow. We find it increases BDNF levels in the brain. Um, it also has an anti-anxiety effect, the ketones. That, we actually found that in our paper in the Alzheimer's mice. That was in the published paper. The BDNF effect is another reason that um, some years back that sort of motivated the idea of trying to look at brain injury at a place like Jump School. There seem to be so many things, uh, as you mentioned, energy, blood flow, BDNF, inflammation, reduced inflammation in the brain after the injury so many things that made it seem like it, it was worth at least looking at. Absolutely. I th I'm, I'm very, this is one of the, as far as translation of this work related directly or indirectly to glutamate, you know, in the clinical trials, I'm most excited about these ketone ester trials. And we'll see what happens. You know, you, you never know until you, you do know. it. Yeah. You know. Well, Mark, you've done such a great job of writing a book that shows how glutamate is the preeminent intercellular signaling molecule that controls things like formation, cellular architecture, and function of the brain. But perhaps the most significant takeaway of this book um, that we've seen is evidence that you collected that shows how aberrancies in glutamatergic neuronal networks are involved in nearly all the major brain disorders that plague mankind. And we can see why you say that your research on glutamate is your most important work after conducting this interview. And listeners will have a much better appreciation for why you titled your book on glutamate, Sculptor and Destroyer, which again, we love that title. Books are a lot of work, as you and Kenneth discussed, but you must be pleased to have it finally published. Yeah, I am. I only hope people will read it. I, you know, <laughs> it turns out with a social media and kind of the modern technology and so on. I think, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people are reading less, particularly nonfiction textbooks. But I think this book, you know, if, even if you don't know much at all about the brain, this is a good place to start because in a way, the way the book is written, is kind of a, a short course on the brain and how it works and how it develops and functions and what can go wrong with aging and specific diseases uh, and, and the implications of this for people's lifestyle and, and maybe down the road clinical interventions. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with the book. I was really excited about the intermittent fasting book. You know, it, to me, it's uh, kind of a, a simplistic thing in a way that the intermittent fasting it's not as complex, and I guess that's why I like this glutamate book more, because it's um, a lot more basic science and neuroscience. Yes, uh, they're both good books, uh, particularly like the most recent one on glutamate. When we interviewed you back in 2022, the most recent interview, you were still recovering from that bike accident that you mentioned earlier. It was quite a bad accident. And uh, what I'm wondering, uh, are you back on the road riding your bike or have you took up other activities instead? Um, I'm not on a mountain bike. Uh, so now I'm back, I would say, well, I'm not. Physically, I'm maybe 40% what I was. So I'm, I'm doing, I'm walking, trying to walk, you know, 5,000 steps a day. I'm doing station, stationary bike is good. I can get my heart rate up like 130 yeah. and go for a half hour, work up a sweat. You know, it, it was interesting when I couldn't exercise, it was just dramatic. My resting heart rate went up, you know, from the 50 some beats per minute into the seventies, my blood pressure went up. And then as soon as I got back doing the aerobic exercise within a few weeks, blood pressure back down, and by a month, resting heart rate back down in the 50s. So, but one thing I found out, Ken, is very interesting. 
So I'm still having a lot of pain issues. And I've had pain issues when I look back at my life for decades. Um, for decades, I've had to sit on a kind of a donut cushion when I sit down because I get a lot of pain on my rear end. And then after these accident and surgeries, I had tendonitis in my ankle tendons. And so a neurologist of mine diagnosed me with some peripheral type of peripheral neuropathy, but it was kind of an unusual one. And so we did um, uh, genome-wide exome sequencing on my DNA. So essentially, we sequenced all my genes. And it turns out I have a mutation in a voltage-dependent sodium channel that's highly expressed in nociceptive neurons, the neurons that convey pain. Mm -hmm. And my mutation, there's a colleague that we both know at Yale, Steve Waxman, mm -hmm. who's an expert on these mutations. And so he hadn't seen my exact mutation. It's a one amino acid change in the protein. It's in a poor region of the channel. And so he was kind enough to have the person in his lab make my specific mutation in this. It's called NAV 1.9, the sodium channel. And he put my mutated gene in cultured dorsal root ganglion neurons and recorded activity. And the bottom line is this mutation makes me more sensitive to pain. So my pain conveying neurons fire more easily than probably years or dawns. So something that for you would be like mild discomfort or you might not notice it. To me, it causes me to perceive a lot of pain. Hmm. So, so I'm still, I've found a, a couple of drugs, actually antidepressant works pretty well, deloxetine, uh, but I've tried other drugs and that's about all that works for now. Well, Mark, this has been great fun as always, and thank you for joining us here today. Yeah, I've been, enjoyed it very much. I, you know, I think you're thinking the same thing. We could spend three or four hours talking about this, but I enjoyed it. I actually have another podcast to do in 10 minutes. <laughs> so. Wow. And you have your own podcast, uh, Brain Ponderings. Yeah, it's on, you know, the audio is like on Spotify and I have a YouTube channel as well. Great. Fantastic. I'm sure it's a wonderful podcast. I'll check it out. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. We always love to talk to you. So thank you so much. Likewise, I enjoyed it and have a good holiday season. STEM talk. 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 So I always enjoy speaking with Mark. And while Mark's reputation as the godfather of intermittent fasting is certainly well deserved, I totally understand why Mark views his research into glutamate as his most important work. And I really thought this was a great, insightful interview, as always with Mark. I couldn't agree more, Don. And I really encourage listeners to check out Mark's new book we mentioned earlier, Sculptor and Destroyer. If you're a student who's thinking about neuroscience as a career, this book is an essential read. And if you're someone who wants to better understand how to optimize the short and long-term health of your brain, Mark's book is also an essential read. So I strongly recommend the book. So if you enjoyed this interview as much as Ken and I did, we invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes at stemtalk.us. This is Don Carnegie signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There you can also find more information about the guests we interview.